Thank you. We are also delighted to host this evening's uh, discussion, roundtable discussion. Um, I guess this goes without saying, but it is amazing how much change can happen in one short year. Uh, last September, we actually dedicated this new university center. And some of you may have even attended that dedication ceremony. And I will tell you that when the university uh, envisioned building this particular university center, we saw it as the heartbeat of our campus. And that is because it is located in the center of our campus, but also we saw it as a strategic initiative to help advance our smaller, smarter mission by providing a central location for our student services and to also provide a location for our campus community to congregate, to study, to meet, et cetera. There was another vision that we saw for this university center and that was that it would bring, it would engage the community uh, by serving as a venue for events and activities just like this evening. So while we would love for you to see our campus, our smaller, smarter campus, in its full bloom with smiling faces on our campus, uh, unfortunately in the current uh, state of, our, of the health crisis, we're unable to do that. So we are grateful to be able to provide this location, the, the Judy and Paul Andrews Hall, as a location for tonight's critical discussion. So I do want to welcome you, and I want to invite you back to our campus when we are all in a much safer place. Mayor Price, welcome. Guest, welcome. Thank you. I think Patrick, Pastor Patrick Winfield from the Potter's House is going to give us the invocation. Would you rise if you're able for the invocation? Father, we love you and thank you so much for this day and every blessing that you give to us. Every opportunity that you give to us to live and to breathe, the oxygen that you have created us to survive in, we thank you. And we thank you, Father, for these moments that you give to us to discuss, to discuss answers, answers that many hearts and minds would be waiting on even during these great times that we live in. We ask and pray, Father, for wisdom to be dispensed, for hearts and minds to be opened, Father, and that at the culmination of this discussion, that there would be changes and transformations that will happen, such as to bring about peace and unity in our community. Bless all of these august leaders who will participate in this discussion and these community members, O oh God, who will hear and also add their participation to it. Help us all, Father, to be changed after this moment. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Winfield. And because this is intended to be more of a conversation, I know we're spread out and it's hard to have a roundtable conversation with people this spread out, but we have to do this safely. Rather than go to the podium, Everyone that's speaking is welcome to just speak from your seat because you have a microphone and you certainly, if you'd rather go to the podium, you're welcome to do that also. I just wanna thank you all for coming. I'm Fort Worth Mayor Betsy Price and many of you I know and I know you are very interested in this community and moving the community that we all love and that we all share forward to make things better for all of us, for everyone in the community. So thank you for joining us. And to those who are watching virtually, thank you for being with us too. We would love to have had hundreds of people here. But again, you all know for the last 10 months nearly, this is how we live and our new normal will be something we'll adjust to and learn to. Wesleyan has been so good about stepping up and sharing their resources with us, reaching out of the community and hosting so many things. And it's nice to have them there. And Potter's House is always in the community working. So Pastor, thank you for that. One year ago, this community came together to mourn the loss of one of our own, a Tatiana Jefferson. 
Her family is here with us tonight, some of her family, and we will give them a chance to make the last comments this evening when we close. In some ways, it's really hard to believe it's been an entire year this coming Monday since Tatiana's tragic death, but yet so much has happened in that year. I promised a year ago that she would not be forgotten and that her tragic death would propel change in Fort Worth, and I believe that we've done that. Are we done? No, we're nowhere near done. We're just starting on changes that can make a difference. And they are slow moving in many cases, but they will make a difference for all of us, for our children and our grandchildren too. At the time we said we would bring in an outside panel to review Fort Worth Police Department and that we would hire a police monitor and those and other efforts have indeed been done. Our panel of experts reviewing the police department has given us a preliminary report and their final report will be coming out a little bit later this year. We hired Kim Neal as our police monitor. Kim came on right at the start of the COVID and, but she's done a yeoman's job getting out in the community. And we liked the candidates who interviewed so much and we thought the work was so important that we added to the budget and also hired Denise as the assistant police monitor. And she is with us tonight because uh, Kim is out of town. And both of them are going to make a significant impact on this community. And they will have their comments about Citizens Review Board and other things, some tonight, and their final, not final reports, but their interim reports before long. I don't tell you this to be defensive, but I do want you to know there is hard work going on. And it started long ago, but it really ramped up after we lost to Tatiana. The community members should hear us that we are listening to you. You told us what you wanted and we are working towards that. Change never comes fast enough for anyone, but I want you to feel the steps that we are taking. We have made major steps but there are miles and miles to go. But those steps begin to add up. You take one and before you know it, you're half a mile or a mile into the journey. My hope is that this evening's conversation will allow us to all stop and reflect on a Tatiana and where we've been and what's been done, but also to take a look at the road ahead and what remains to be done in this community. The truth is the city simply cannot do this alone. The police department can't do it alone. It will take each and every one of us pulling in the same direction to make this the city that we all dream about. I'm joined today and I'm thankful that Corey Sessions from the Innocent Project is with us and Carol Harrison Lafayette of United My Justice. Both are two big strong voices for this community that we have had continued discussions with throughout the year. Last year I said, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. It was a scripture I quoted when we were in mourning, and it still applies. And this past year has indeed been incredibly humbling for all of us. But we remain committed to that justice and mercy, and we remain committed, as I said, to building a better future and a better Fort Worth for everyone. And I look forward to hearing my fellow panelists update and conversations and to taking the questions. We've had some questions submitted and we will take as many of them as we can and you will have a chance to write questions and submit those and we'll get to as many as we can. So we're pleased to have Dr. Jason Shelton with us from University of Texas at Arlington to moderate for us. So Dr. Shelton, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Mayor Price. It's actually uh, Fernando Costa. You're going to give us a little bit of background on the why we are here today, sir. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shelton, Mayor Price, panel members. I'm Fernando Costa, Assistant City Manager, and my task is to provide an overview of tonight's program and to try to place it into appropriate context. And I'll try to do so by following the advice of President Franklin Roosevelt for public speakers. 
He said, be sincere, be brief, be seated. You know, try to proceed accordingly. As we get ready to mark the one year anniversary of Tatiana Jefferson's untimely and tragic death, we do well to reflect for a moment upon how racial injustice and violence have affected our community. And even more important, as Mayor Price suggested a moment ago, to engage in a mutually respectful conversation, a true community roundtable, about what we've been doing and what we'll need to be doing in the days ahead to promote justice and peace in our community. This is not the time or the place for a long history lesson, but we might note that racial injustice has affected Fort Worth for as long as Fort Worth has existed. Whether that mistreatment was directed toward indigenous peoples or Native Americans who were here first, or toward Mexicans who occupied Texas before it became an independent republic, or toward African Americans who were brought here originally against their will. We might also note that racial injustice has often resulted in violence, epitomized perhaps most starkly by the Fred Rouse lynching, the 100th anniversary of which we'll be commemorating next year. Finally, we might note that civil rights reform in our country has tended to follow a predictable pattern of incident, protest, response. Think, for example, about the arrest of Rosa Parks, the resulting bus boycott, and the eventual integration of Montgomery's transit system. Or think about the many other struggles that occurred across our country during the late 1950s and early 1960s, culminating in the 1963 March on Washington, an eventual passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Or think about the late John Lewis, who left us just a few weeks ago. How he and others suffered terrible beatings on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the ensuing march from Selma to Montgomery, an eventual passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. These lessons from our past are still relevant today because in the famous words of William Faulkner, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Think then about how this pattern of incident protest response has played out recently in Fort Worth, particularly as significant changes have begun to occur in the wake of three different police incidents. The first such incident in December of 2016 involved the police department's unnecessary arrest of Jacqueline Craig which brought worldwide attention to our need for better police community relations. After eight months of protests in response to that incident, the Fort Worth City Council in August of 2017 appointed a 23 member task force on race and culture. The council gave that task force a big responsibility to assess the extent to which various disparities in our community can be attributed to race and culture, and to recommend practical strategies and actions for reducing those disparities. I'd like to recognize Council Members Kelly Allen Gray and Gina Bivens, who work closely with Mayor Price in creating the task force. I'd like also to recognize Mr. Kerry Session who Mayor Price introduced earlier, and who served actively as a task force member. 
After 16 months of intense work, including many public meetings to engage the community, the Task Force on Race and Culture in December of 2018 produced a set of findings and recommendations that have appreciably reset the course of Fort Worth City Government in a variety of ways. For example, the task force recommended that we establish a robust program for civilian oversight of the police department. The City Council has already created an Office of Police Oversight Monitor, totally independent from the police department. And Denise Rodriguez from that office will be able to speak with us tonight about their activities. Another major outgrowth of the Task Force on Race and Culture was the creation last year of a Diversity and Inclusion Department. This new department continues to enforce civil rights laws as they pertain to employment, housing, and public accommodations. But the department is also breaking new ground as it vigorously promotes equity in municipal contracting and in the delivery of municipal services. Diversity and Inclusion Director Christina Brooks is also on tonight's panel and will be able to give us more insight into that work. In total, the Task Force on Racing Culture recommended 22 strategies for addressing disparities associated with criminal justice, economic development, education, governance, health, housing, and transportation. In the interest of time, I'll refer you to the city's website where you can access the full task force report as well as updates on our implementation of their recommendations. The second police incident sparking local protest and change was, of course, the killing of Atatiana Jefferson in October of last year. And we are honored to have members of her family with us here tonight. That incident led to an even sharper focus upon our policing policies and practices. On the advice of City Manager David Cook and Police Chief Ed Krause, the City Council authorizes to hire a panel of national experts who would evaluate our policies and practices and would provide us with their impartial recommendations for improving our performance. Deputy Chief Neil Noakes is with us tonight and will be able to tell us more about that study. The most recent police incident, the killing of George Floyd in May of this year, didn't occur in Fort Worth, of course, but it provoked expressions of outrage here as it did in cities around the world. The protests in Fort Worth were certainly energetic, but they were largely peaceful and constructive, thanks to groups like United My Justice, and leaders like Carol Harrison Lafayette, who is also on tonight's panel. Those protests led to a greater public awareness that the responsibility for public safety doesn't belong solely to our police department, but rather is shared broadly by all of us who live and work in this community. After the citizens of Fort Worth voted by a wide margin this summer to reauthorize sales tax funding for the Crime Control and Prevention District, Chief Krause and City Manager Cook recommended and the CCPD Board approved a fiscal year 2021 budget that shifts significant resources from law enforcement to social services as an effective approach to crime prevention. Chief Noakes has been a leader in that effort and may wish to tell us more about it. Taken together, those three police incidents and their aftermath remind us that Fort Worth has experienced its share of racial strife. But I think it's also fair to say that Fort Worth in recent years has tackled the hard work of racial justice more directly, more transparently, and more effectively than have most cities around the country. We have much more work to do, of course, and tonight's program provides us with an excellent opportunity to discuss that challenge. 
In closing, I'd like to say a word of introduction about our moderator, Dr. Jason Shelton, Associate Professor of Sociology and Director of the Center for African American Studies at UT Arlington. I've gotten to know Dr. Shelton in recent months as he has agreed to chair a panel of national experts who will be studying the possibility of developing a museum or cultural center that would celebrate Fort Worth's African American history and culture. He has a good perspective on the issues that we're here to discuss, and we extend to him a warm welcome. Dr. Shelton. Thank you, sir, and thank everyone for being here this evening, whether you're here on campus with us or at home watching virtually. It's a very difficult time in not just our city, but the country. A uh, little bit of housekeeping before we get into discussing this very important topic tonight. Number one is that, of course, the intent and the reason why we are here is to discuss a Tatiana's death uh, and of course, also the big picture of issues of police, policing and black communities, as well as the bigger picture of where do we go from here in not just this city, but this country as well. That being said, uh, the city of Fort Worth is currently under a gag order that prevents panelists from getting specifically into a Tatiana's death and the events that took place last October. Nevertheless, we did ask the community to provide questions for this discussion. And I believe it is very important that you all in this room and at home this evening submit questions to be a part of this dialogue. I do have a few questions, but it's always important to get the community involved. We have some questions again, and I will facilitate those. Please note that you all are here to observe and, and, and be a part of this discussion. I want to also acknowledge that Councilwoman uh, Bivens will be leaving the panel a little bit early tonight as she has a prior engagement. Last thing is for our panelists to know that you've got to turn on your microphone. Literally, you will see a green button, a green light there to make sure that your microphone is on. And now with no further ado, we will begin our discussions tonight. I think it's important by beginning, not with me asking a question, but letting these panelists speak. They're gonna have two minutes to say whatever is on their heart, mind, spirit, and soul on the topic of the evening. Um, we're gonna go in alphabetical order. The first person tonight will be Councilwoman Bivens. She will be followed by Brooks, um, Fernando Costa, Kellyanne Gray, Carol Harrison Lafayette, Neil Noakes, Betsy Price, Corey Sessions, and Denise Rodriguez. Councilwoman Bivens, you have two minutes to say whatever is on your heart, mind, and spirit. Thank you, and thank those of you who are here. And I also want to thank the mayor for inviting me to leave my district and, and be here tonight. Uh, when you take a look at what is happening and what has happened in my hometown, it is still saddening, but what I can appreciate is the efforts uh, what we have to do in Fort Worth is make room for everybody at the table, even those who you don't want to hear from. And I won't need two minutes for now, sir, because I have some more to say when I come back. And it involves how we hire police officers. Christina Brooks. Good evening, everyone. Give a special thank you to Mayor Price and uh, Fernando, Dr. Shelton, and most importantly, the family of Tatiana Jefferson and the people in the community that felt this was an important enough topic to come out this evening. As the wife of a black man and the mother of two black sons and three black daughters, the work that I do in large part is as much for them as it is for the beloved community of Fort Worth. The work that is being done in our department, our brand new department, is tied to my heart. It's not something that 
I do because I have a degree in it or because I read some articles. It's because it hits close to home. And every aspect of the 22 recommendations in the Race and Culture Task Force across criminal justice, economic development, education, governance, health, housing, and transportation is something that I know firsthand. And so tonight I am honored and humbled to be here to share what our department has been up to since its inception last October. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fernando Costa. I think I'd like to yield my time to the other panelists. Thank you. Very good, sir. Kelly Ann Gray. Thank you, and, and thank you all for being here. And um, let me just say, my heart is heavy. And my heart has uh, been heavy since December 2016 when I woke up and I saw the video of Jacqueline Craig and, and everything that um, ensued in that incident. And then I, I sit here and I, I see Ashley sitting in front of me and what I so vividly remember, Ashley is sitting here with the t-shirt on and she says, I am my sister's keeper. And you are, you are. And I remember the conversation um, with you and your sister and your brother at Corey's house with the mayor and, and Chief Krause and I, and you talked about Tatiana, and you talked about how she was the first. She was the first in your family to go to college. She was the one that you all sacrificed for. She was the one that you all uh, wanted to make sure that she achieved her dreams. And that stays with me because that's who I am in my family. And I've never forgotten that. And with each incident that happens, I always come back to you all. And it has not been an easy time in our city. This past year, it has not been an easy time in our country this past year. And having conversations about race and social injustices uh, is never an easy conversation, but it is one that we have to have. It is one that we have to um, get past whatever it is that um, we are feeling and we are believing to recognize that the only way we're going to be able to move forward um, is if we set our differences aside and we really and truly come to the table and figure out how we do this um, together. I'm going to stop because I have tears in my heart because it, your hurt is my hurt and I need you to know that your hurt is my hurt and whether you know it or not you have a whole group of people who love you and who are cheering for you and who are standing with you because we are Tatiana Jefferson thank you Carol Harrison Lafayette. The pain and the hurt will always be with us. When Darnell Ballard reached out to me, I'm a legal specialist and an activist, I couldn't help but say yes, Darnell, because I thought about Antitana Jefferson. And we used the opportunity to organize a, a, a Tatiana Jefferson we used the opportunity to make sure that we could organize a peaceful protest. And we did exactly that. And when I saw a diverse group, and at one time it was almost about 1,000 people, not only were we chatting George Floyd Lives Matter, but we knew that we had to do something. And we did exactly that. And so, Many people, as I talked to the protesters that came out, they were saying no justice, no peace. And what they're really saying is accountability. 
And as we continue to sit down and have conversations together, uh, we can overcome and get policy changes. It was so important that not only the protesters who came out and stood as a crowd marching in the streets, that we heard what their purpose was. And most of the individuals that we spoke with, they wanted to see justice. They want to see changes made. And that's one of the reasons why I'm glad to be a part of trying to get policy changes and working with leaders because there is so much pain and we have to heal from this pain. Thank you very much. Neil Noakes. Tatiana Jefferson. Tatiana Jefferson. We're introducing ourselves, but those, we, these aren't the names that matter today. They truly aren't. We're here for a reason, and it's not a good reason. We're here to honor a life that was lost, and we're here to talk about change. Many of you have probably heard me say this, but one of my favorite quotes about change is, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Does anyone know who said that? That was the American novelist and social critic James Baldwin, the late novelist. And what he's saying is, just because something is faced doesn't ensure that success is, is going to follow. But failing to face those issues ensures failure. I want to applaud everyone that's up here that had the courage to stand up here and talk today. I want to thank everyone that's out here in the audience that came to support this cause. The only way change, real lasting positive change, is ever going to happen is if we do it together. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, sir. Betsy Price. Since I had a chance to open, I will yield my time, Dr. Shelton, so that we can get on with the conversation and we can hear from the rest of our panelists. Corey Sessions. I, the cure for all that is ill in these United States was established decades ago. It is the last four words and the first score of words in the preamble ensure domestic tranquility. Everything else that follows after that should be done, should have been done. But when the Constitution was written, it did not include people of color, did not include females. But we have since transformed and interpreted it to mean what it should have been. But that is where it is. We must not vilify a uniform. It is never the uniform. It is the individual in that uniform that disgraces it, that makes it bad for all the others. I hear it from all sides. In order for us to edify this city, to build it up, we must unify this city. And once we unify, we have beautified. My wife is a police officer. My sister was the city attorney for the city of Austin for many years. And my brother was the first posthumous DNA, DNA exoneration in US history, right here in the state of Texas. We have more in common than what separates us. When I saw the mayor, the police chief, on television talking about the officer, who I won't mention his name, who killed a Tatiana, saying that he was wrong. Something said, call them, let's meet, let's all talk together. And I remember that conversation, all of us in the room, in my living room. And we realized that there was more in common than what divided us. Thank you. Last but not least, Denise Rodriguez. Thank you, thank you for having me. And um, 
most importantly, thank you to the community who's here and who's listening in. Um, I'm looking forward to this, this discussion. I think it's gonna be very important for us to have. I do wanna also acknowledge that, as the mayor mentioned, and as um, Christina mentioned earlier, that this has to be a collaborative approach. We've gotta work in this together. And I think the other part too that we have to remember is this is just one piece of the puzzle. When we talk about racial inequity, when we talk about racial injustice, um, we have to involve the criminal justice stakeholders, we have to involve educational stakeholders, healthcare, all of those pieces kind of work together. Um, so unless we're kind of speaking in that broader approach, um, that's, that's the way forward. Thank you. I gotta go, bro. Thank you all very much. I wanna, I gotta, like I say, I got a couple of questions here, but we're gonna get right to the heart of the matter for the sake of time. Um, Let's get to it. What meaningful changes have been made in our city over the past year? What still needs to be done? And I'm gonna let anybody go when you're ready to hop in. We're, we're done with the alphabetical order. What meaningful changes have occurred in our city and what still needs to be done? Just raise your hand and I'll see. I'll run this like I run my class at UTA, Mr. Noakes. Some of the positive change we've seen in the Ford Police Department, it's, it's come from listening to the community. Uh, it's come from listening to some of the chants. You mentioned no justice, no peace. And it, it makes me think of the words of Dr. King, who said peace is not just the absence of tension, it's the realization of justice. Justice is what we all want. And there are members of our community who don't feel justice in their dealings with the Ford Police Department. The primary changes to policies that we made have been to use of force and de-escalation. Uh, two of the most important and critical parts of uh, a police officer's job. We have to make sure it's done correctly. We've improved training. We've included de-escalation in all of our use of force training. We have uh, changed policy to require de-escalation in situations where force is a potential. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have, uh, when officers make the scene, if they have to use force, they are required to explain what de-escalation techniques they use to prevent that force from happening in the first place. Uh, we require our supervisors to make the scene, as always, but they don't just speak with the officer and get his point of view. They'll speak with the person on whom the force was used. They'll speak with potential witnesses who saw what happened to get their perspective as well, so it's not just one perspective. Uh, in addition, these supervisors are reviewing the reports to make sure officers are explaining their attempts at de-escalation throughout the incident. Uh, one of the things that we've done with our training that is absolutely critical, not only is the de-escalation part of the training, we use what's called scenario-based training. And we basically put the recruits in scenarios that will be sim similar to what they would face in the streets because we want them to face those in a controlled environment first before they have to face it in the community. As a matter of fact, some of you are probably familiar with the president's, uh, I'm sorry, the final report of the president's task force on 21st century policing from 2015. Uh, then President Obama uh, put a task force together to look at policing, see what was wrong, see what we could do better, and see what policing in the 21st century really needed to look like. And training was one of their topics, one of their pillars. And one of the things they recommended was scenario-based training. There's research that shows when scenario-based training is done accurately that you actually experience the same physiological response you would experience if you were doing it in the community. So we want officers to have that to fall back on. They don't have to try to remember policy, they remember the interaction and they know how to respond appropriately. The other thing we did, and I, I know I'm not alone in this, but I know police officers across the country that were absolutely horrified and disgusted watching the George Floyd video. I remember sitting in, in my home, this video's old, it's, it's happened days ago, and I'm screaming at the TV, get off his neck. Just get off his neck, that's all you have to do, let the man breathe. That's so frustrating. And then days later, we see more video. There were more officers there that did nothing. And the only two that stepped up and even tried to intervene, even tried to intervene, were the newest officers, the rookies, if you will. 
One who I believe had only been there a matter of days, a couple of days in training. He actually tried twice. Hey, maybe you think we ought to get off his neck? You worried about excited delirium? And the response, no, we're good where we are. No, sir, you're not good. What we realized is that was a gap in our training. There's a culture in law enforcement where people who are newer to the department don't feel like they can step up and take action when necessary. We have to make sure they understand not only is it a right for them to do that, it's a responsibility for them to do that. They have to. So we're creating scenarios where not only do they try to talk another officer, a senior officer, off of a subject if they're using excessive force, that officer is required to use force himself against another officer to get, push them off. Do what you've got to do, report it immediately, do not allow it to happen. Officer Noakes, for the sake of time, appreciate it. We, we yes, want to get to, I want to get to a few more people, but I do want to ask a quick follow-up. Uh, in light of the changes that you just mentioned for Fort Worth, what does it mean in real world terms? How will these changes impact uh, fewer, fewer deaths, fewer moments like we have witnessed in our city over the last few years? What de-escalation training does, it makes officers pause. Now, some situations are completely dynamic, I understand, and there is no time to pause. If you walk into an, an active shooter situation at a mall, you act. But more often than not, officers have the luxury of time. If there's no threat to anyone, there's no threat of anyone escaping, anyone being injured, pause. Take a moment. Try to build a rapport. Uh, I think a lot of people here are probably also familiar with the, uh, procedural, the tenets of procedural justice. Treat a person with dignity and respect. Be neutral in your interactions. Don't pick sides. Give someone a voice. Let them be heard. Sometimes all it takes is letting someone be heard. So to wrap up that answer, we're giving officers more tools to take time to deal with individuals rather than resorting to force quickly. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bivens. The remarks from, from uh, Officer Noakes ties directly into my concern and it deals with before we even hire officers. I was with a group of HR execs, it's called the Human Resources Execs Network yesterday, and one of them talked about how her company has gotten this upgrade of an assessment tool. And so you wanna be able to know who you're hiring so that you don't have to do so much corrective training. And I'll be talking with our new HR director when he comes on board, but this tool, she raved about it so much, it, it lets you know how a person is likely to act under, under pressure. You know, is that person to, able to rise to the top and speak for the good, or are they gonna be influenced by those officers, in this case, who did not enough? And so I think it's important that we take advantage of the HR tools that are available to us so that we know who we're actually hiring. You don't wanna hire an officer who grew up in a very conservative, all-white neighborhood. That may not be so good in my neighborhood of Stop 6. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're hiring someone who has gone through the proper training before they get hired and mess up. And so this tool, I'm gonna to be telling our HR director about it, Mayor, when we hire someone. And there are th th these tools have been around forever, but this one is, is just very, very different because of the way it is able to detect likely behavior. And when you're looking at behavior, that's how employers determine what kind of employee that you're gonna be. In our case, say for example, you have a West Side trash pickup, stop six trash pickup. When I come home on trash day, it's trash bins all over the street. Uh, friends of mine who live in a different neighborhood, not so much. And so we have to deliver service with respect. Uh, when it comes to the trash guy, you know, he has to be respectful of, of where he is, but when it comes to that officer, his failure to respect could result in loss of life. And so I'm real concerned about how we hire officers so that we hire the ones who are likely to be able to embrace the words serve and protect. And when you see me leave, I'm going to a church, get out the vote, but I'll hang as long as I can. Thank you. Ms. Brooks, can you speak to diversity and inclusion initiatives in the city of Fort Worth? Absolutely. I want to focus in on two specific areas that I think we, our department has made uh, some significant progress as far as um, equity goes. And that's uh, number one in our business equity division, which is responsible for uh, the oversight of, our, uh, of the city's business diversity ordinance that looks at uh, equity in city contracting. That's how the city is spending money. 
So this year, uh, we actually completed the city's disparity study. And that disparity study, uh, of course, revealed some information that I'm pretty sure that anybody that's familiar with contracting uh, wasn't uh, exactly news to them. But what it did do is it provided some really good disaggregated information on African-American contracting and how we are doing specifically with African-American contractors. And uh, so using that information um, under the city manager's uh, recommendation and approval, we've moved forward to not only make edits to the current business diversity ordinance so that equity runs throughout it, uh, but we've also made changes to our administrative regulations. That means our internal processes, how people that work within the city that deal with contracts actually make sure that they are uh, working in an equitable way to ensure that especially African-American contractors uh, are getting a fair shot at, uh, at, at contracting with the city. And so um, in doing that, one of the major things that we've done is we've removed a cap that used to be in place that held minority contractors uh, listed as a prime or first tier contractor to $100,000. We're, we've removed that. And so with the new ordinance, uh, now minority contractors can compete for contracts at any dollar amount, not just up to $100,000. And we've already seen uh, some, uh, some results, some positive results with our first uh, contract, one of our first contracts uh, with McKissick and McKissick. Um, gaining a contract with the city for a significant amount of money over uh, multi-years. The second area that I want to, oh. We got to keep, we got to keep okay. moving. Ms. Rodriguez, Ms. Rodriguez, can you speak to the role of, of community policing in the city? Yes, thank you. Um, so as the mayor mentioned earlier, our office is still relatively new. We, ordinance was passed in February and then Kim Neal started in March, so our office officially kicked off then. Um, and we're still, well, we're nearing the end of kind of the first step, which is just getting a better understanding of the community and the police community relationships. So over the last couple of months, um, in getting our office going, we've met with a number of community leaders, folks who are here in the room. We've held a number of um, community sessions virtually because of COVID, unfortunately. Uh, we most recently completed some police community collaboration sessions where we brought together police officers and community members and tried to get at the specifics about how to address the issue with police community trust and building those relationships. The next step is kind of take all of that input and turn it into action. So how do we then take what we've learned from the community and build policing strategies that are specific to neighborhoods, specific to communities, to address some of the issues that have been brought to us by the community through the surveys, through our meetings. Um, and that's just the first step. Again, we're, we're still new. We're still, um, folks are still getting to know us. We're still getting to know the community. Um, and we're, of course, most definitely looking forward to the next steps. Thank you. Anybody else want to hop in on this question about the changes that have been made in the city? Anybody else want to speak to this? Yes, no's, and maybe so's. Well, now y'all see the, the Tatiana signs. Let's talk and say it has been a year since her passing and her death in the city. I'd like the panelists to speak to the mood of our city, the mood of this room. And please talk about the mood of the city, the mood of where we go from here in terms of making sure that this does not happen again. Anybody want to speak to that? The mood of our town the mood of this room, where, where do we go from here? Where we go from here? Where we go from here? Wait, 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 I'm not from it's, Fort Worth either. It, I'm it, not it, from Fort Worth either. Come on, y'all, let's let the conversation evolve. Let's let her go. Excuse me, where we go from here, we have to continue with these conversations. Many protesters, many citizens, taxpayers are wanting justice. And that means accountability. 
So how we go from here is we continue to have conversations with the councils, with the mayors, to try to get police reforms. When you see uh, individuals such as attorney uh, Leon Reed, who walked over 200 miles to Austin, Texas, to speak to um, the governor to try to get policy changes, not only do we continue with the peaceful protests, but we have to get changes made on a local level. We gotta get changes made on a state level, a federal level. We must get a police oversight board to listen to the citizens. Um, because when you continue to have police officers who are not held accountable for using excessive force, for police shootings, and never having any accountability, you are gonna continue to get a chain effect and we have to continue to work together to get changes made. And it's to listen to those. Mayor Price, can you speak to the mood of the city? What would you say to the folk in the room regarding the mood and the tone right now, ma'am? You know, Dr. Shelton and the community, I would say the, the mood is very uncomfortable. People are very much ill at ease right now and looking for the right answer. And depending on who you talk to, I don't know that there is any one right answer. Yes, there are significant changes being made in the way we police in this community. There are significant changes in the community and how they're responding and what they're demanding and people are listening. But I think as a whole, the community still has a heart for Fort Worth and still has compassion for each other and that they're willing to come to the table and do the hard work because part of the justice and the equity redefinition, redefining of the roles begins with the quality of life here and that begins with childcare and education and health care and where we see, and policing falls right in there with that. And all of those are being worked on and changed in this community. I do think it's a very personal matter for how people feel about their community right now. And I think most of us are listening and all of us are well aware every day of a Tatiana Jefferson's loss. Corey, can you speak to, with respect to the Innocence Project, can you speak to what's going on in black America and why folk are so fired up in relation to this issue. One of, the, one of the reasons is people are sick and tired, and as Martin Luther King said, it's still true today. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of the same thing. Um, there is a George Floyd Act that is going to go, uh, that the governor and I have talked about, that he's wanting to get done, but I told him just, about two weeks ago that there needs to be a Tatiana, a Tatiana Jefferson Act as well. Um, she was from Fort Worth. Uh, it, okay, there can't be a conversation if there's interruptions. Feel free, okay, feel free to correct me. But tell us about the policy. Let me Where just we, tell you. What's your suggestion, sir? My, the, the suggestion is that we still communicate and everybody, please, Please, when this session starts up, when they have committee meetings, please show up. Stand there. If it's four hours, five hours, I've been there to three o'clock in the morning just to testify. Please come and testify and make your voice heard. They hear you. They Council hear Woman, you and they will hear you. Councilwoman Gray, will you please speak to the mood in the city and where we go from here, ma'am? So, Dr. Shelton, um, it doesn't feel good in Fort Worth. And in truth, it hasn't felt good in Fort Worth a, a long time. And uh, as, I, as I sit here and I listen to the conversation, there are two conversations that's happening. Because Christina talked about contracting minority contractors and things that we had done, that we are doing, and Neil talked about police. Here's what I need you all to know. There's been an undercurrent that has been rumbling and rolling through this city. 
And it didn't just start. What blew the lid off of it, what, a, what literally blew the lid off of it was the death of a Tatiana Jefferson. It was the current that has just been building and building and building from economic injustices, racial injustices, social injustices, and that, and her death is what erupted the volcano. And for so many years, um, we talked about race, but we talked about race in such very hushed tones. Black people talked about race, white people didn't talk about race because race didn't affect them. But it was a conversation that we always had. Now we're having it publicly. And it's one of those things, it's that conversation, as I said earlier, it makes you uncomfortable. It makes you uncomfortable if you're black because now I have to explain to somebody how I feel as a black person in a situation. Then I have to make you as a white person understand that I'm not playing a race card, I'm playing a real card. And my differences, our, our differences, um, so many times are parallel, our, 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 our comparisons are parallel, but then when you add race into it, it becomes perpendicular. It's, it's a conversation that you can never, ever understand. So, yes, it is about a multitude of things. But because of a Tatiana Jefferson, we can have this conversation. Because so many times it has been like pulling teeth to just understand, to just have somebody understand that when I get pulled over by the police, I'm nervous. I'm nervous. And I said before, I'd much rather be pulled over by a veteran officer than a rookie officer, because I'm never quite sure what that interaction is going to be like. And as a mother of a now 18-year-old son who's six foot three and 240 pounds, every time he leaves the house, I'm nervous. And my late husband, was Fort Worth PD. So it's not a good feeling. It's not a good feeling for anybody. It shouldn't be a good feeling for black people. It shouldn't be a good feeling for white people. It shouldn't be a good feeling for brown people, blue people, pink people, purple people. It's everybody should be uncomfortable, but we should be having this conversation. And so you can keep your pictures up because you're absolutely right. She is the reason why we are here, and her name is Atatiana Jefferson. Thank you very much for that. Uh, got another question here, and that is, as, as leaders of the community, you folk up here at the front of the table, at the front of the room, as leaders of the community, what do you need to do personally in order to be in greater tune and touch with everyday people in the community and in the city? What do you need to personally do in order to be in greater touch with the people in the community? Anybody want to offer Sir Noakes, sir? It's really pretty simple. If we want to be more in tune with the community, we have to be in the community. I think for far too long, we in law enforcement have expected the community to come to us on our terms and do what we think is best. The difference we're seeing now is if we're going to provide a safe space for everyone, we have to work on public safety with everyone. We have to meet people where they are. We have to realize, look at the areas where we're not seeing uh, the same crime rates. What do you see there? You see a lot of resources. You see a library or a swimming pool in every corner. You see all the, the, a great job market, low unemployment. Look at the areas where we're seeing more crime. You see food deserts. You see low performing schools. You see areas where people are looking for work but they can't find it. And they haven't been given the job training to take that job in the first place. And sometimes when industries come in, they hire from outside the community. We have to actually be in the community to see what the issues are. We can listen to someone talk all day about what the problems are, but we have to actually be out there. We have to see it. 
I'm not going to stand here and tell you I know how you feel. That would be disrespectful to you. I have children, and Councilmember Gray, I've not had to have that conversation with them. I'm fortunate that I haven't. So I can't say I know how you feel, but I empathize with you and anyone else who's had to have that conversation, especially if it's been because of a negative interaction with law enforcement. I will say we have some amazing men and women on the Fort Worth Police Department that do great work every day, but we're not perfect. We're working to be the best we possibly can be, and the best way to do that is by being in the community. Appreciate that, sir. Fernando, what do you personally and what do folk in the city manager's office need to do to, to heal this gap and this divide, sir? I think we need to do our part to bring into this conversation the folks who are not here tonight, who are not watching remotely, who are not engaged. If I were to use a common term, the Fort Worth way, I think I would get diametrically opposite responses from different segments of our community. If you're white and affluent and belong to a country club and have a good job, the fourth way is wonderful because you benefit from it. But if you're black and poor and live in stop six, the Fort Worth way means something entirely different. It means you don't have a voice. It means you don't have a seat at the table. And so, we need to bring folks into this conversation who don't even realize we need to have this conversation and who don't even realize that they themselves have as much a stake in the outcome of these discussions as the folks in this room. And so that's how I int intend to do my part, Dr. Shelton, to address the issues that uh, Tatiana Jefferson has brought to our attention. Appreciate that, sir. We really don't have a whole lot of time, um, and we need to continue to grapple with this as a community. I would recommend that this be session number one on this matter, and hopefully more discussion in the future. Um, I'm going to ask one last question, and I want every panelist here to speak to this. And we've spoken, of course, the reason why we are here is a Tatiana Jefferson. Um, Y'all know I'm a professor, and we deal with a whole lot of things related to the black experience in America. I want every panelist to tell us, if you could wave your magic wand, I heard that and change one thing about this city of Fort Worth. Y'all have talked about policy. You've talked about a number of things, and that's fair game as well. But if you could wave your magic wand and change one thing about this city that would bring about greater equity and inclusion in the city of Fort Worth, what would it be? Christina Brooks, it doesn't have to have anything to do with your office doesn't have to have anything to do with the position that you currently hold or the reason why you are here. But if you had one thing you could change, what would it be? Christina, you go first and we'll roll down the line. The distribution of resources equitably instead of making sure that newly formed sections of uh, the city are equally as prioritized are as the communities that have been in Fort Worth from the beginning and have been denied economic, financial, and human resources. 
that on the corners of stop six, that liquor stores are replaced with grocery stores that have fresh food and meat that's not spoiled. And the cigar shops are replaced with healthcare clinics where reputable doctors look at black women and black men and listen to them when they tell them what the problem is. And they understand that just because we have melanin in our skin doesn't mean that we have a higher threshold for pain. That we can see, that we can walk our children down the street and know that when they walk into the elementary school or the high school or the middle school that's within walking distance of our home, that the teachers are providing a curriculum that represents accurately the history of our people as part of the American history. Thank you, Ms. Brooks. I see y'all which is say her name signs after everybody has spoken one by one. So Ms. Brooks is just done. Let's say her name after everybody speaks. On the count of three, y'all say her name. One, two, three. <laughs> Ms. Rodriguez, please tell us if you could wave your magic wand, what would you change in this city? Um, a couple things. Uh, I think accountability would be the word that comes to my mind first. Um, not only accountability, from a more systems approach or um, an office organizational level, but also at the individual level, accountability for ourselves, for our own actions, for how we interact with each other. And along those lines, more empathy. And this is probably not only a city Fort Worth wish, but a global humanity wish where most of us, many of us need more empathy and how we engage with each other and how we um, engage with police officers or community members. We just, more empathy. If we had a little more empathy, we'd have a little more compassion, be a little more open to making changes that are might be outside of the box. Thank you very much. On the count of three, one, two, three. <laughs> Mr. Sessions. If if I could go back, I wish I could go back in time, as we all do. Um, but none of us can go back to yesterday and make it today. But we all can start today and make tomorrow a better for everyone. Um, I wish I could make everyone, police officers, citizens, jurors, judges, blind like justice is supposed to be, blind, but somebody along the way keeps giving justice cataract surgery, bifocals. They want it to be, to see where it is not blind. I wish we could go back in time and live up to the words that are in the Constitution, what is in our hearts. And I wish I could go on Allen Avenue back a year ago and close the door. But I can't. But her death opened the door. The, her death opened the door for this conversation and for so many other people who have been mistreated by law enforcement, by the judicial system. Thank you very much, sir. On the count of three, say it like you mean it, y'all. One, two, Three. <laughs> Ms. Price, Mayor Price. You know, if I could change one thing, I would wave my wand over it and people would not see skin color, not see wealth, but we would all see caring, loving hearts and equity. And a lot of that begins with education. And I'm talking about, as Christina said, 
equity in education. If you walk your child down the street to the school, you should have exactly the same expectations that your child's gonna have the same education that a child on another side of town is getting. That jobs are readily available to everyone in this community. That healthcare and access to food and healthcare and healthy living and that education are there for all of us and that housing and transportation are available for everybody. I think the youngest among us is where it really begins to change. If we can change the trajectory of their lives, we can make it better for everyone. Thank you very much. On the count of three, y'all, one, two, three. <laughs> Mr. Noakes. For me, it comes down to opportunity unfortunately not everyone in every community gets the same opportunities not everyone gets the same chance not everyone has the same hope one thing about a Tatiana Jefferson that I've been told over and over again she had hope she had hope for a bright future she had big plans everyone should have big plans everyone should have hope that those plans can be realized every one of us has a part to play in that and I know I have a part to play in that I'll say again, I know we're not perfect. If I could wave my magic wand, I would make sure those opportunities were available for everyone in the city of Fort Worth. One, two, three. Tatiana. Ms. Gray. If I had one wish, what would I change? I'd change perception. I'd change how we perceive um, our neighborhoods. I would change how the media perceives our neighborhoods and how they report if something happens in the South Side or Stop Six or Eastwood or Polly, the media tells you it happens in Stop Six, Eastwood or Polly. If it happens in TCU, Tanglewood, any place else, you never know where it is that it happens. And because of that perception, um, we don't get uh, those economic opportunities. It is a lot harder for those economic opportunities to come our way and we do a really, uh, we have to do overtime to sell our communities and our communities have value. I shouldn't have to um, go four or five miles um, to the other side of town to buy groceries and to shop because my money is green just like everybody else's money is. And so if we, as an economic group, um, is spending our money all across town, you would want to make that investment into the community. I would change, the last thing I would change is our perception of each other, um, how we treat each other, um, in our, in our communities because we have spent a lot of time talking about um, police involved shootings, but we come with our own share of, of uh, hurts and issues that we have to figure out how we heal within. So what I would change would be perception. And we don't have to say it on three because I'm gonna say it. Her name is Atatiana Jefferson. Say it loud, say it proud, Atatiana Jefferson. Ms. Lafayette, Ms. Harrison Lafayette. Okay, if I had a magic wand, I would most definitely bring changes to police reforms. We have to think about when you have police shootings, how many days did it takes to arrest police officers? We have to make higher bonds for them and there has to be some type of accountability. We must continue to engage with leaders citizens, voters, taxpayers, to find out what it is that they want to adapt in their communities. We have to continue to have conversations. We got to sit down and we have to make sure that these shootings stop. It starts on a local level, starts on a state level and a federal level. We must get oversight boards we must get federal oversight boards. And when we do this, we can be a part of the changes for the better Fort Worth. Thank you. 
on the count of three. One, two, three. Yeah. Fernando. Thank you, Dr. Shelton. And by the way, thank you for agreeing to moderate tonight's discussion. Because if I could change one thing, it would be our attitudes toward talking about these difficult issues. We have a tendency as human beings to avoid subjects that make us uncomfortable, particularly subjects that require us to change our beliefs and our actions. But I think tonight we've had one of the most honest and thoughtful discussions in which I've been engaged in a long time. But these, these kinds of discussions should be common and they should be prevalent across our community. Not just a special event, but a habit. And if I had a magic wand, that would happen. Thank you, sir. We've been through the row. I'm just about done before I hand this to Mayor Price. Dr. Shelton, what would you change if you had the magic wand? Oh, man. You live in this community also. Wow. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of things that I would change. Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles, California. I didn't own a red shirt till I was 22 years old because I lived in a crip neighborhood. So look at my chest, the, the suit I have on tonight. Then I left there and I went to Cleveland, Ohio. And I've, then I moved to Miami, Florida. And now I live in the great state of Texas. In all of those places, black people have been second class citizens. And all, I remember as a kid watching my father get pulled over by the LAPD because he drove a Mercedes Benz in South Central. And the cops told him the only time they've seen a black man in a Benz was a dope dealer. And I'll never forget that. But let me tell you the flip side. On the flip side of that, my parents had two boys. One of them would grow up to be a professor. The other one would grow up to be an airline pilot. I know homies and got homies and frat brothers that have done the same things and sorority sisters and homegirls that have done it too. The problem in this country is a deep-seated issue of racial inequality that we have not been honest about for centuries. We need to address those issues of poverty, of inequality. I firmly believe, and as a professor, I, I can tell you the day that I, Tatiana, we found out the day your sister was killed. I was teaching introduction to sociology to 250 students that day and I put my lecture on the back burner that morning. I was supposed to come in and talk about something. I can't remember what it was, but we opened it up and just said, damn it, let's talk about it. Just let it flow. What we need to do is let it flow. And that's why I say tonight is just the beginning because we gotta let her speak. And we gotta let my man speak. I know you do, but tonight's not the night, y'all. But I'm advocating for you because half of the game is letting people express themselves. But that being said, ladies and gentlemen, this conversation tonight has to lead to bigger, as I've always said to my students, what ultimately matters is policy, not personality. Policy changes. I follow you. I feel you. What changes the circumstances of the contemporary African-American experience is more policy that allows the doors to open so that more black folks who are college with college degrees can have more sons who become college professors and airline pilots. How does that happen? Because we've got to have greater economic development and opportunities and public schools good jobs. and good jobs. So I'm glad y'all fired up tonight, but let us continue to remember the long arc of this game is not just about police brutality. 
It's also about economic vitality, and that's what opens the door to American dreams. I'm sorry for teaching. I get into it. I start preaching like Pastor Whitley Whitfield here. That being said, the magic wand, the magic wand that I would change, if I could change anything right now, I would make sure that every young African-American child in the United States of America has a quality education and has the opportunity to, to make it happen for her or himself. Because the, that's what's up, I give you that too. I give you that too. That being said, Mayor, Oh, wait, 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 wait. This is what, what, what I really wanted to end with. We're going to say her name five times hard. And then, Mayor, I'm going to hand it to you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. But that her sister is going to speak tonight. Her speak, her, it was my suggestion. It was my suggestion. We're getting there. I said to them, I said, hey, if she's coming, we got to give her the floor. Ms. Mayor, wait, 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 wait. Let's do it five times hard. On the count of three, one, two, three. A Tatiana, a Tatiana, a Tatiana, a Tatiana, a Tatiana. Thank you. Dr. Shelton, thank you. And to all the panel members, thank you for taking your night and mostly to the community, thank you for being here. It's an important conversation. It's a hard conversation. Kelly and I have had many of these and we don't always agree, but we're still good friends. And we are listening to each other and I've learned an incredible amount from my fellow council members and from many of you. It's a, this is hard work as I think Kelly opened with, and many of you have reiterated. But it also is work of the heart. It must come from a place where you love this community, a place where you're willing to do the work. You can't just show up when one instance happens. For a Tatiano was the one whose family pushed her to go to school, to get a degree, to be in STEM education. So we should show up and push other children to do that. We should show up for economic development in our neighborhoods, help recruit jobs and get them going. This is just the beginning of the conversations. When we get past COVID, I would love to see the room filled for conversations, for roundtables with so many more people and not just the same faces, but other faces, young parents, grandparents who are raising children who need to hear what's going on in their city that they love. We have the pleasure tonight of having a Tatiana Jefferson's family with us. Her uncle and aunt are here on the Jefferson side and it's my understanding y'all don't wanna to speak tonight. Okay. And then Ashley, Ashley Carr, her sister is gonna start out for just a minute. Then we'll let the Jefferson speak and then we will close with a word of prayer from Pastor. Ashley, you probably do need a microphone. I got a mask on, so we all good. Good evening, everyone. First, I would like to thank the community for being with our family since day one. Um, there's been a lot of days of silence, reaching out to the city about different things and excellence, and it felt like we were by ourselves. And we appreciate you guys always lifting us up, calling and checking on us, making sure Zion and Zayden are good. This is what, this is our family. Um, you guys uplift the only nonprofit organization that is made by her family, the Atatiana Project. We appreciate Fort Worth for accepting that us and accepting that. A, a, a nonprofit that is gonna bring STEM opportunities to the community, to the South Side community. That's where we start at. Cause that's, that's the neighborhood that looks like the neighborhood we grew up in, which was Oak Cliff, Texas. So y'all already know. Um, for anybody else, 
Um, you guys know who her family is. You all know where 1203 East Allen Avenue is. My request, my only request tonight is that we do not disrespect a Tatiana's legacy and we leave, the, we leave the mic at this is. I'm the only person that will be speaking for the family tonight and that's what we, I would like for you guys to respect that. And thank you guys so much. Um, let me, let me say this, hold on, hold on. I thought it was fam, I thought, I thought y'all made it a sense of the family, I'm sorry. All right. For anyone that don't want to hear, that's fine. But in order to have a child, there has to be two people. I'm standing on behalf of Mr. Marquise Jefferson, who died 28 days later. So, unfortunately, unfortunately. Um, on behalf of Marquise Jefferson, um, a Tatiana Jefferson's father. On behalf of Mr. Marquise Jefferson, Miss Carr, Miss Carr. I understand your passion, but I would ask that we don't delve into family violence here and arguments. Right. Well, we appreciate where you're headed and not know where you're going to get there, but as I said, on behalf of the Jefferson family, Mr. Jefferson, um, we hope that the city becomes everything you're trying to do. Pastor. Can we, uh, everyone stand up, let's pray. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Family, one of the things that I think is very important is that we understand that there cannot be any change if we don't hear. Um, within my profession, I live within the crucible of pain and hearing the conversations that comes out of it. And oftentimes they are certainly uncomfortable. A family is still in, is in, is in pain. And you've got to be able to hear it because if you can't hear it, you can't heal it. That is a part of this process and it is uncomfortable. 
but I think it's very important for us to understand what has transpired and what has happened. No matter how much we talk about police reform, no matter how much we talk about the things that needs to change, there is a loved one that is gone. We cannot bring her back. And a family is still hurting and a family is still in pain. It's not our responsibility to exacerbate it. It's our responsibility to hear so that we can heal. Now, whatever has happened within the context of the family, that's something that the family has got to deal with. And we pray for them because it's hard to deal with discrepancies when you have so much pain. I hear the pain and it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. Because a family and a community is broken. As a family, as a city, Let's rally around them as much as we possibly can. And if we are to have another opportunity to speak, that we give them an opportunity to talk. And that we honor the family with what they want us to do. And we have deep conversations on the reforms that we need to have and bring to the table such as to bring healing. Because no matter what we do, we can't bring that life back. Tatiana is gone. And the family is in pain. So I would ask for everybody who may not understand that level of pain, don't judge it. Don't prejudge it. Don't call it a black thing, a poor thing, because there are people who have money, people who are millionaires who have this kind of pain. It's a part of the humanistic fabric of our life, so don't judge it. Pray for it. Pray for that family, pray for their hearts, because that's a lot of pain. And one year does not dissipate that amount of pain. Let's, let's pray. Father, you are a beneficent and great God. Thank you. Thank you for the leaders who participated in this round table. Thank you that their hearts were open to the possibilities of hearing things that are uncomfortable. Now, Father, we all as leaders bring to the table possible answers. We're trying. But I pray, Father, that in the midst of all of the answers that we're bringing to the table, that we bring our hearts and our minds and our ears to the table too. To hear at a deeper level the pains and the pangs of a community. Now, Father, we pray that you would bring healing, that you would bring healing to the Jefferson family, that you would, by your grace, cover them. Allow, Father, for the mourning and the grief that they deal with and they struggle with on a daily basis, oh God, to eventually subside because you are the God of all consolation. Be comfort to them through the arms that will hug them, through the lives, oh God, that will pay attention to them, through the policy makers, oh God, that will create policies and structures, oh God, that would ensure that this kind of travesty never happens again. And Father, that we would be able to love each other without the shade and 
without the prejudices that blinds us to each other's human plight. I pray for these leaders. I pray for every family that's represented that may be dealing with their own measure of pain, but it may not be on display now. That then we will all find healing even in the midst of your saving grace. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mayor, for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Sheldon.